If I told you to climb a mountain and bring me a flower from the highest point and you would die after completing your task, would that be meaningless? Of course, it's trivial. And if there are a million people waiting at the base of that mountain to whom that water flower was a symbol of their freedom and they would follow that symbol and your death into a struggle that would liberate half a billion souls, would that have a meaning? You see, we create the meaning in our lives. It does not exist independently. Here is the greatest truth I know. Your death thrust then will have a meaning if it comes while you're in fullest pursuit of your heart. I wasn't on your side. I was on the side that says it's not the role of the military to set policy, or depose presidents, or fire on our own ships. We follow orders until one comes along that violates our conscience. Then we have to decide whether or not to follow it and take the consequences. Maybe you'll be proven right. Hmm? Maybe they'll stick you in front of a firing squad, but your decision affects only you. You can take a stand without destroying the chain of command. I am a soldier, Mr. Garibaldi. And as such, my vocabulary is rather limited. I only really understand three words. Loyalty, duty, honor. If I did it your way, one of those would have to go. Then the other two would become meaningless. Troubles on board the station. Because from now on, Babylon 5 belongs to me. Watch an all-new Babylon 5, next Wednesday at 10 on TNT. You have transmissions holding. Badge incoming signal. Full audio and video decode. Purple files accessed. What you are about to see has never been shown to anyone outside the break house. out there in podcast land welcome to gray 17 a babylon 5 podcast part of the front row network and npr illinois community voices we're a group of newbies watching babylon 5 for the very first time and a group of first ones who are watching babylon 5 for the umpteenth time and we are here today to talk about season 5 episode 5 learning curve i'm scott and with me is what emily Kathy, kevin and nicole we're short a Mike and a Justin to this week, but they'll be back just as soon as possible. Before we get started, a reminder to click all the links down below. We have our social media links. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as we do have our Patreon where you can get access to our Discord server. Our Discord server includes both a general and a spoiler chat, so you can jump into both of those with any uh, donation to our Patreon. And thank you very much to our great council members, our producers who are listed down below, who give the most each and every week to our Patreon. Also, please remember to like, subscribe, follow, click the uh, notify button if you're watching on YouTube, as well as click that subscribe and like button. And if you can, please head over to Apple and give us a review. It definitely helps us get out to more people. And we did get another review in, guys. This one is a five-star, and it comes from... Trekkie Trey, the Trekker from the United States. And it starts as a negative, but Blake tells me it gets more positive, so I'm going to read it all. Just stick through it, is the title of the review. Well, much like the TV show, this wasn't great at the start. It was a messy audio, lots of anger, and for God's sakes, the pseudo spoilers that Scott would give. I think he's referring to Kevin, but he thinks it's Scott. With that being said, they all grew on me. I actually put look forward to this podcast, but seriously wish they would maybe fact check some things that they state as fact. For example, the Centauri Trilogy books. Cinna was Lord Rufa, Rufa's daughter, not his 
Pasliota Jano family that Londo had to absorb into his I don't care. I'm moving on. Uh, Jesse is hilarious, although I find that they all tend to be super passionate with their anger. She has it honed to a skill. Good job, Jesse. You have honed your anger. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> also, the love is equally heard in this podcast. Scott drove me crazy and really bugged me at the beginning, and I almost stopped listening. Well, maybe you should have. Because the rest of us too. Yeah, because of reasons. But after the vibe of the show was found, it settled into a great and entertaining podcast. You're welcome for your five stars. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. You only deserve 4.9975 stars, but that isn't an option. So I shall round up in your favor. XOXO. P.S. Scott, I appreciate you now. Well, I can feel it, buddy. I really do feel it. (laughs) That's pretty funny. Nice job leading the teams and guiding the masses and creating great content. Again, Blake said that was a positive review. I'm questioning, but we got five stars, so we'll take it. We'll take I mean, it. I thought it was positive, I liked Kevin. It. Yeah. You too can confuse Kevin and me when it comes to spoilers. Oh, please. By posting on Apple reviews. And be sure to give us a five star. We really do appreciate it. Okay, you're, guys. You're famous for spoilers, and I'm famous for kicking my butt about one spoiler. So, you know. Sure. What the fuck do people think I'm angry for? Like, we need to talk about this. This Um, Exhibit A. (laughs) Why the fuck do they think I'm angry? I think I'm fucking delightful, by the way. So (laughs) I think you're delightful, too. Thank you. And Kevin, to be fair, Mike spoiled something last week, so it's fine. Okay. (laughs) Now I need to go back and listen. It's fine. It's no Mm. big deal. It's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and start talking about learning curve. We're going to go to our newbies first and get their first impressions, and then we'll get to our uh, first one's first impressions, and then we'll talk about the episode in total. So before we do that, though, I believe Jesse has a synopsis for us. Oh, I do. Two, (laughs) forgot. Two Minbari Rangers in training come to the station and learn a difficult lesson. A new underworld boss tries to take control of the down below. There you go. Good job. I'm proud of you. Fuck. Two men barres walk into a bar. <laughs> Terror. And find out Nagrath is dead. The end. Okay, we're going to go to first impressions from our newbies. And Jesse wasn't here last week. And there's a scene in this episode that I'm wondering if Jesse latched on to. So I want to hear from her first. Jesse, first impressions. Well, I liked this episode more than I liked the last episode. Didn't really love the last episode. I had to turn it off, take a nap, because, you know, first season was a lot of napping. But. This episode, I actually kind of enjoyed. I'm kind of digging the like dynamic between Wish Ivanova and uh, <laughs> and Garibaldi. What's her name? I don't even know her name. I'm not gonna learn. Lockley, her name. Captain Lockley. Lockley. Okay, uh, we don't have that many se- episodes left of this season, and I like I have zero desire to learn her name. But I I kind of like whatever's going on there and. Some shit went down with uh, Dylan and and Sheridan, and we got to see him in bed again. Yay. <laughs> the one episode where they weren't in bed at all is the episode you skipped. Yes. <laughs> okay. I when I saw that. What was the what was the thing that you see that you were wondering if I missed? We'll talk about it later too, but it's the Lockley Garibaldi scene. Oh, okay. When they're eating breakfast. Emily, we were informed that we uh, lost a YouTube viewer because of the anger that you have for the episodes. So Emily, go for it. My anger? Uh, yeah, it was actually, it was specifically for in the beginning. And I went back and you were the only one who didn't like that episode. So it was definitely you <laughs> who scared off the viewer. <laughs> Whoopsie. (laughs) Well, that was not intended. So this episode was, I mean, wasn't great. Wasn't terrible. Way to go, Sheridan, being a dumbass. Like, really, you're going to handpick Lockley to take the position and not tell Delane that this woman has seen you naked? Like, really? are, Are you that dumb? Apparently, the answer to that is, in fact, yes. Yes, he is. But just, you know, another thing to add to my list of reasons why he's shit and I don't like him. <laughs> I hope that wasn't too angry. Bunch of angry bitches. Oh, Nicole. You all have to excel at something and that's my <laughs> Nicole, the positive one. Please be our ray of sunshine this week, Nicole. <laughs> well, I will try. I'm not feeling so great today, but I'm, I'll am i try to be my usual sunny self. But overall, I thought this episode was good. It was kind of boring at times, but overall, I thought it was a good episode. I really thought it was interesting to learn a little bit more about like 
the Centauri training and what they go through, like for the Rangers and stuff. And Nicole, before all the fanboys completely lose their minds, you mean the Minbari training, not the Centauri training. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Different Sorry. aliens, different Again, news. Not feeling great, guys. So give me some slack here. But yeah, I'm just, I'm just hearing all the clackety clack of the yeah. keyboards. She <laughs> said the wrong thing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, sorry, let me rephrase that. It was interesting to learn about what the Rangers go through for the Minbari training that they do. It was kind of cool to see them on the home world doing all the training and that those interactions. I kind of had to pat myself on the back a little bit for one comment that I heard in this that we could talk about a little later. But yeah, overall, I hated that Trace dude. What a cocksucker. The minute I saw him come on the screen, I'm like, I want to punch this dude in his face. And then putting the hit on our dear, precious, sweet Zach Allen. How dare you? You protect Zach Allen at all courses, okay? Like, I was pissed about that. So I did not like that. Uh, obviously, we know what happened in the end there. Um, but overall, I thought it was a pretty cool episode. It was a good lore episode, I thought. We learned a little bit more and got some backstories. There was one quote that really stuck out to me that I wrote down, which I thought was really cool. I feel like it started slow and then it kind of picked up at the end a little bit. But yeah, it wasn't bad. We'll go over to our first ones now. Kevin, first impression. I'm not wild about this episode, but it's not a bad one. I, I do like the the Ranger stuff. There's a nice callback in this episode to marcus talking about his ranger training so it's interesting to see some of the insides uh, of the of the training and what he was talking about with the terror portion so i found that interesting and i i thought the scene with uh garibaldi and lockley was really good although i have some thoughts and troubles with it but the but the scene was great the acting was great overall fairly decent episode but not not super super great like i also enjoy this episode it, especially that scene with garibaldi and lockley and i go back to the stories they've talked about the audition process and that was basically the audition was her and jerry doyle getting into arguments uh to see how they could stand off against one one another so that that was her audition process was kind of what became the scene here. So I really liked that scene with the two of them uh, going head to head in there. But I also liked the bit with the Rangers and with what you get with the Rangers where they go basically whoop some ass and gets into the Mimbari as even discussed between Zach and Garibaldi was they don't walk away from a fight. They, they do not know how to do that. I'm having season one deja vu, but in a good way. I came into mm -hmm. season one thinking, okay, this is going to be a dog. I got to get through this. And I came into season five remembering the same thing, man. This is going to be the dog of the season. And we've been we've been saying that for a while, that the season five is not uh, as high quality. But again, I'm five episodes in and I'm liking this stuff. I love the Ranger stuff. I love finding out more about what's going on. Nicole, to your point, the lore building. Uh, I even liked what I was calling Kano, a wish.com Kano. But then I realized he actually was Kano. He wasn't wish.com Kano. He was Kano from the 1995 Mortal Kombat movie. That's what he sounded like and he was. So let's dive in. Jesse, what do you got? You fuckers are, are comparing me to Lockley, aren't you? Yeah. 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 And I'll tell yeah. you what, when you go back and you listen to the Beyond the Rim segments, we've been doing that for a while, sweetheart. Yeah, the reason why is because of that whole conversation between her and Garibaldi. I was like, yeah, no, she fucking let him have it and said, fuck you. Okay, now it makes all, all the sense in the world. If it makes you feel better, Lockley's a badass, and so are you, so that's why we compare her to you. I know, but you know, I just, here's the thing, you know, my love-hate relationship with Ivanova, and I'm, you know, I don't like change. So I'm having a hard time. She, I'm sure she's a very lovely lady. Um, but I just don't. I really like really can't wait for her to kind of get a little bit deep because we haven't seen her much this season. We saw her the first the first episode and then didn't see her for a little bit. So we're really now just kind of getting back into it. So I, I'm you know I, I guess I'll give her a chance, but. I also said that I would never give Ivana a chance either, and I turned out to love her. So well, let's keep down this road. Let's talk about uh, Lockley because Jesse's right. This is the first time we've gotten kind of a it's not really a central Lockley story, but we get her a lot more than what we have been getting her. So, Nicole, what do you want to talk about? Well, since she kind of brought up the whole Garibaldi Lockley scene, we could maybe start with that. I enjoyed that scene. I think my favorite part about it, though, was two things that are probably uncommon. 
Zach trying to defuse the situation, talking about like the cumin and the garlic and all, like trying to like, what's this taste funny? This taste just kind of sitting there awkward in the middle of mom and dad fighting over breakfast. And I thought it was kind of funny how when she walked out, everyone applauded. <laughs> like, what do you do in that situation? They just clap. Like, it was kind of funny and kind of, I don't know, it made me laugh, which I don't know if that was the right reaction to that moment. <laughs> But I laugh. What else would you do in that awkward situation? Like you're in the dining hall trying to have breakfast. Here's these people screaming at each other. It was just hilarious. Overall, I thought it was interesting because the thing about Garibaldi is he's a straight shooter and he goes right for the gullet. He's like, tell me what side you were on. Like he is not throwing any punches and he's asking her straight up like what she thought. But what I liked was that she gave it right back to him. She didn't back down. She wasn't afraid. She kind of like told him, you know, how it is and put him in his place. And then fast forward to her and Sheridan talking about how Sheridan said, Michael's a good man. And she goes, I know he is. It'll take a while. I'll handle it. Kind So it's like she already kind of has an opinion formed on him that she knows he's a good guy and that she'll like him or maybe she does like him. But they're butting heads. So she's trying to figure out how to diffuse that so it was kind of interesting to see that juxtaposition of them arguing and in each other's faces and then the conversation about Garibaldi that she had with Sheridan Kevin so the scene was great I just have a small problem with how it's written it just portrays Lockley as a little too simplistic for my taste I think it really glosses over the fact that what Clark was doing, attacking and bombing civilian targets and all that. And I feel like, you know, she boiled it down to, I I, I couldn't disobey orders. Well, it, you know, they some of those orders were illegal orders. So it just, it, it, feel, it felt like it was written a little too simplistic for me. That being, and, you know, we can agree to disagree, but but what what I do like about it is how good the the acting in that scene was. It's clear that they they cast her character extremely well because you know that that whole scene was phenomenal. Blake, feel free to disagree with Kevin because I would do too. I, I mean, I'm going to disagree with you, Kevin. But I I see where you're coming from with that. But the way I read it was that. Her simplistic take was more of a pushback to Garibaldi's kind of you were with us or you were against us. And so it was a whole her whole going off was it's not that simple. It's not as simple as we were on your side or we weren't on your side. And so she kind of went into playing his game of let's just go as simple as you want it and put in there that she only knows the three words of duty, loyalty and honor. And that really made her point that while she maybe didn't agree with Clark, that as someone who took those three things seriously with the uniform, she didn't agree necessarily with how they went about taking Clark out either. So I, I think the simplicity part, like I said, I can see where you picked that up, but I think it was more of a pushback on Garibaldi trying to make it a black and white yes, no issue than her actually being played simplistically. That's an interesting take. I mean, Garibaldi was not so much wrong in in what he said exactly but he was an ass for the way in which he did it in public the the way he really went after her pinned her down and knowing knowing his character it surprises me that he wouldn't ask her that question without knowing the answer he knew because, the answer that's why he asked right right which is which is my point he didn't have to be an ass about it, but of course, you know, that's typical Garibaldi, the way he's doing it. So that's an interesting take, Blake, that she was, that she's not a simplistic person, that she was, she was kind of going down to his level. That's, that's an interesting take. I have a third take. First, I'm having flashbacks to Severed Dreams because we had this very same conversation when we talked about it. And, uh, and we actually talked about Beyond the Rim, Lockley, that she was going to come up and this was going to be a thing. And I don't think she's trying to be simplistic i don't think she's going down to his level i think she is talking about exactly what she feels that as a military officer she has to follow orders we had this conversation again too when we uh, had the end of season four and you're assuming that she committed war crime you're assuming that she bombed civilians and also you're assuming 
I didn't that assume I, that at all. Time out. You're also assuming that ISN and everyone else let people know what Clark was doing because you said okay, that's that a fair point. Clark, Clark committed war crimes and why are you still following him? You don't know if they knew that. Clark was controlling all the media and all communication. So there's no way to know. And then even she brings it up in her conversation with Garibaldi conversation. Uh, she brings up that if you get an order that you should not follow, then you don't follow it. She flat out said that. And she said at that point, your only job as a military commander is to protect the people under your command. That's it. And so we don't actually know what she did during the war. We know that she was not on Sheridan's side, but we don't know if she followed every single order that she got. We don't know what she did. So I think it's I think it's harsh to say that she was simplistic. I also think, Blake, it's harsh to say that she's trying to be simplistic. I don't think there's anything simplistic about this at all. I think it's very ethically dynamic. And the idea, and I love what she says, you have three things that you deal with in the military, duty, loyalty, and honor. And if you get rid of one of those, the other two don't matter. So if you get rid of loyalty, duty and honor don't matter. Well, but she she said it was simple and it's not simple. And the other thing I'll say is, it's it's really clear to me that there was no other way to get rid of Clark. There, there just wasn't. Not without a lot more time, a lot more dead bodies. So I don't think she's stupid. I'm just not a fan of quite the way it was written because it makes her seem like she's not intelligent. But I know, we all know that she is. Yeah, and all art subjective because I think it makes her look fucking immensely mm. intelligent. I think, I don't, I think we watched, much like it happens a lot, we watched two different scenes because I think she looked extremely powerful, extremely intelligent. She, she did take she, him down though. And great. she took him down. And Nicola, what I love too, you mentioned the applause. Only half the room was applauding. Did you see that? It wasn't everybody. It was like half of them were clapping. So we're still seeing that there's a divide here. There's not only a divide between Garibaldi and Lockley, there's a divide about where were you in this war? And I, I love that. There's there's repercussions. Also with that scene, the one that I'll add too that has nothing to do with Lockley, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, I still see Garibaldi as overcompensating. He continues to point out that he has to protect Sheridan. What side were you on, Lockley? He is overcompensating for the fact that he knows he almost screwed the pooch on this, even if it wasn't his doing. And he is trying desperately to fix that after the fact. And I love that too for Garibaldi. It's something for, that he can chew on uh, while we're going through this. Well, let's talk about Rangers, guys. I want to see a Pacmara Ranger. That's what I want to see. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was really interesting at the beginning how it showed the variety of those who were being trained. There was warrior cast. There was religious cast. There was other aliens in there. And apparently a Pacmara, which I don't think I saw. But it was interesting to, to hear the discussion uh, between Delenn and the two trainers about... This is the way that the Minbari have always done it, but maybe we need to meet the people where they are, essentially. People avoid the Pakmara at all costs, so why not make them couriers? Like, why not use their strengths and what they're good at and change things? So I thought that was a pretty cool discussion that, that happened. And then as far as the on Babylon 5, I think it was funny how they said, Babylon 5, the home of peace, and then flash forward to a big fight breaking out and, like, somebody being killed. So, obviously, Babylon 5 is not the home of peace, which we all know. The whole thing about Tanir running in to save the day when the girl was being assaulted or whatever didn't surprise me because, if I'm not mistaken, he was a warrior cast. You know, that's kind of what they do is they run into the fire. And as we learned at the end, they never back down from a fight. So, he ran in. Unfortunately, he got beat up. But what I really liked, and I don't know, maybe this is the Italian in me, is the application of terror. Sign mm -hmm. me up for that, because that was awesome. When she described what that was, I wasn't really sure until it played out. And then all of a sudden, seeing it happen, I have a lot of stuff to, to say about that, too. So I can let somebody else talk, and we could get into that a little further. But the one thing I will say before I continue is that the whole pat on my back. When they were talking about Marcus, about how he joined for the wrong reasons... He specifically said Marcus was trying to atone for the death of his brother. And I was like, I called that shit <laughs> for once. I got something right. I was very proud of myself. So pat on the back for me. Kevin. One of the thing that occurred to me while we were watching the first scene that was on Minbar was I, I wish that they hadn't completely glossed over how Minbari culture got back to this point where warrior cast and religious cast was was working together uh side by side with with just a little bit of ribbing here and there instead of 
uh, having having some more growing pains. That being said, these these two leaders are more mature, so I, I guess I can see that. But I, I wish they had gotten into that a little bit more because it just seems strange that you know the their world was in such a bad way with basically a civil war and they really didn't do a lot with it after the the new makeup of the uh the great council uh apparently just solved every problem they had i wish they hadn't done it quite that way i swear i'm not just disagreeing with you kevin yes before, you are but seriously i i think they actually did a pretty good job of showing that there's still underlying tension there i mean you had the two main uh teachers the one says well you used to be warrior cast and that's a problem and the new tra the other trainer comes in Durhan, who's a warrior cast member and says really warrior cast is a problem there's they're i think they're trying to swipe sweep things under the rug with the ranger and so we're seeing that they are trying to pretend that there isn't an issue there and i think there still is and i think that was a nice way of showing that without having to go into a whole lot of lore building so i saw it a little differently just it just felt like good natured stuff that people such as us would do Blake, I did love the laughing with the uh, my my inner voice was laughing. I love that uh, people don't have an inner voice that laughs. I do. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I think all of us do because Jesse's just popped out there for a second, which was cute. Uh huh. We're gonna get more of this kind of ranger dynamic, obviously, because we now know that there's still some stuff going on with Lanier. He gets brought up in this episode. I think this is one of those times where it's done well. I like being able to see that the, the Rangers are kind of figuring themselves out. And I also like the Dillon and Lockley interaction where uh, there's still a question mark there of who answers to whom, who's in charge of what, and who is in charge of the Rangers and what can be done with the Rangers. And basically they have carte blanche. They can do whatever the hell they want. And Dillon's in charge, so have a nice day. And I find that interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm liking that dynamic. One of the things that Lurker's guide brought up was that, you know, why would Lockley want this job or not be pissed off and leave because she's been overruled yet again in this in this episode, just as with the, the telepaths. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense to me because you always have in a system kind of like this, you know, some sort of hierarchy where the higher power can come in and uh, kind of take over. And that's exactly what happened. That that seems very natural to me. I don't understand that view. Yeah. And I mean, you always have that kind of dynamic between political appointees mm. and military. I mean, and to your point, the lurkers guy, there was somebody on the Usenet who's like, why does Lockley give to give Garibaldi crap? Because Garibaldi outranks her. No, he doesn't. No. He's a political appointee in a different position. They're on a different pay scale and a different org chart. Totally different tracks. Mm -hmm. Yep. They they could do anything but come to blows and it wouldn't matter. I, I'd pay money to see that. Me Jesse, too. My money's on Lockley. But... I think so. Jesse? Well, she's military too, so mm -hmm. she's used to being outranked. I mean, the, that's the you yeah. just do what people tell you. But my bigger question is why the fuck she would take this job if she slept with Sheridan? Do we know that's what happened? Huh? Do we? I mean, Emily says Sheridan saw her naked. You say she slept with uh, Sheridan. Do we know that? Because we he closes the door and then there's an awkward like pillow talk afterwards. Listen. It, it was implied based on how well they knew each other and they're adults, so good chance of. <laughs> yes. And she's like, well, that's not like him. And Delenn's like, wait, what the fuck are you talking about? And then, listen, Delenn was way better than me because I'm going to tell you right now, one of us wouldn't have been sleeping in that bed. <laughs> sure, he's on the couch. <laughs> yep. Somebody would not have been in that bed if I would have just found out that your newly handpicked, appointed fucking commander it's your ex-girlfriend. Uh, no, sir. No, thank you. Because they're going to be working closely together. <laughs> Very closely. I, listen, not in my lifetime, sir. Clearly, Babylon 5 did not have an HR manual. Clearly <laughs> not. We, we, we learned that when we heard about the list in The Gathering, man. So Sheridan and Lockley are not capable of maintaining a professional relationship. I still argue we don't know what they did. We never were told. I, I although I want the episode to end differently now, Jesse. I want it to end where Delenn is like on the bed, you know, just sprawled out on the big bed, and then Sheridan is down hanging out with Byron's folks with like a little pillow and a blanket. Yeah, just that'd got, be nice. Got thrown down the brown sector. I don't care where you sleep. It's just not going to be in this bed. <laughs>
didn't he say he tried to date after his wife didn't actually die? Uh, he said that there was, uh, uh, it was hard. I believe he said he was hard to get past her. But we also know that he hasn't had much in the way of relationships. So well, it doesn't you know, mean all... they didn't do it, try it at Thank least you. once, and it was awkward and a failure, and that's why they're not together anymore. Well, let's let's do it this way. I was gonna, I was, I was actually gonna ask this question, and I will ask it now, as opposed to as we end the episode. What are your predictions, ladies? And I'm glad that we have all three ladies here. What are your predictions on what actually happened? between Sheridan and Lockley because we will find out but what do you think actually happened I think they slept together okay yeah at least once and it was probably awkward and uncomfortable and she was like I can do better (laughs) (laughs) well my thought my thought is is that obviously there's some sort of trust between them and like some sort of they know each other well and it could be a friendship like a good friendship where they serve together right obviously there's some sort of trust between them and they may or may not have hooked up but they're not together now and he's married. So I feel like I don't really care what happened with them in the past. But if there was something that happened, he should have told the Lynn like, OK, when you get into a new relationship and you're serious about the person you're with, I don't know about all of you, but I've talked about. <laughs> Do you bring out the Dead Sea Scrolls and like, <laughs> on no, this date? no, but like, you know, you you talk about previous relationships and, you know, things like that and just what went wrong, what didn't, what you feel like you, you know, your partner pretty well, right? You know what they've been through, you know, I feel like in the sense of th- them two as like a couple, they maybe should have had some discussions about pre- previous transgressions before tying the knot. So if if she's mad about anything, it would be that maybe he wasn't honest or upfront with her. I think for me, it's not necessarily that she's there and she's working. It's more so you didn't tell me about it. That's what I would be pissed about. As long as she's doing what she's supposed to and he trusts her, they're not together anymore, clearly. And she has no interest in him, obviously, the way she treats him. It's not not so much a, a threat of like, oh, my God, he's working with his ex. It's more of you should have been upfront with me. So that if there was something that happened between them, I can see why Delenn would be pissed because it's kind of like a little bit of a betrayal. You should have fucking told me. Like, if I randomly met somebody that my fiance was with and he was like, oh, yeah, by the way, I fucked that chick. I'd be like, excuse me? You know what I mean? Like, there's a, I don't know. And then I appointed her to the head of our station after I banged her. I agree with you because there wasn't like a time that I like pulled out a notebook and was like, ahem. Right. Let me go through. <laughs> it wasn't like a listed timeline with details, no. but it was like I did this douchebag once and this is what yeah. happened. And, you know. Right. Or exactly. As they came up, somebody would be like on my Facebook and I'd be like, oh, by the way. And that but you know what I didn't do? I didn't um hire them to be my. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's the like, point. And then yeah. all of a sudden be like, oh, by the way, you just found out from somebody else like fuck off i would i'm telling you right now I mean, I that's exactly the point you know and and sheridan whatever it was sheridan says yeah i didn't find a good time but i should have told you it's like well okay yeah you fucked up bud well he she said you should have the second you thought about it you should have probably brought that to my attention and then she's all nice and sweet and like i'm just gonna act like you were gonna bring this up i'm gonna tell you right now you can get your ass out of this bed you can go where the fuck you need to go and rethink about what just happened because this is not working for any of us. Yep. Sometimes they're best forgotten. <laughs> On next week's episode of Grey 17, we'll talk body counts. It'll be great. Oh, we won't. <laughs> no, we, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> We're not. Listen, motherfuckers, <laughs> I pay somebody good money for that shit. <laughs> we are not doing it with the general public. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I am interested to see what was what was found out. Also, too, just to kind of piggyback off your question, Scott, how many of you think Garibaldi straight up looked at that record that was that Zach just walked away and what like he went back and opened it up and read her her record? Oh, he absolutely yeah, did. 100%. Absolutely. No question. I also think there's a lot of sexual tension there. So between Zach oh, and Garibaldi, hundred percent, hundred percent. Not Zach and Garibaldi. oh, maybe Lockley and Garibaldi should just anger bang and get it over with. That's what I'm saying. Oh, between... I'm sorry. I, I I think there's sexual tension between Zach and Garibaldi myself. Oh, okay, yeah, no, that's I'm not, not gonna what lie. I was talking about. I was talking about Lockley and Garibaldi, but I mean, okay. hey, they all need it. The, the entire Babylon Five command staff just needs a swing and call it a day. Yeah. 
I will so, say too, even though he has passed away, Jeff Conway is looking pretty good with the sh- short haircut Zach Allen uniform. Like he looks better than he did as Kinnicky. And if you're a Grease fan, everyone thought Kinnicky was so cute in Grease. I think Zach Allen is cuter than the Kinnicky character. Mm-hmm. I'm just putting well, that out there. And it's it's interesting that he seems to be the only one that kept that uniform, which I like without the shawls. None of the security uh, outfits I, I liked particularly. So I'm glad that at least he is keeping that uniform going. Well, he had to go through the tailor process like four right. or five times to get it to work. I want to point out, going back to the predictions here, that Emily and Jesse absolutely think that Lockley and Sheridan banged. But Nicole, our resident shipper who wants everyone to fuck, <laughs> is like, maybe they did, maybe they did. <laughs> I mean, I think she'd yeah. be too upset if she found out that Sheridan and Lockley had had a very intimate relationship and he didn't tell Delin because that's that's wrong. And you're then all he- gonna feel really icky when you find out that they're stepbrother and sister. <laughs> Just saying. I, I see. There's something between them. Like there's there's something more to the oh, story. Yeah. So, but why would Delin be mad that that was his stepsister? Or why would Delin be mad that they were friends? That's that I'm trying to think of the things that would piss me You're right. off to the point well, where I'm Well, and not... I mean, Sheridan is from the South, so the stepsister thing, you never know. <laughs> it could oh. go. Damn. Ew. But, but really, I mean, Florida. I, I think you all hit on it already. Regardless of what the situation is, I don't think it's that the situation happened, whatever that is. It's just Delin had to find out about it through talking to Lockley. Mm-hmm. That's how she found out that there was something there. So I think that's the key. But we'll see. Also, we should be happy that Sheridan actually maybe slept with one of one other person besides Delin and his wife, right? Because like, yeah, exactly. Like good old farm boy. You know what? If you did have another one, good for you, pal. Because I can't see it otherwise. As Jesse just, drinks her wine. We all just assume that Sheridan does not fuck. That would, um, space. What's, uh, hey, Ryan. Oh Ryan. Ryan. There it is. Sorry, Ryan. Um, isn't that what he always says that Sheridan doesn't fuck? He says Sheridan's a missionary guy. He hasn't elevated past that. I can't believe I just lost his name. You broke Sorry, his heart, Ryan. Jesse. I know. I'm mad at him because he gets mad at me about the bed comments. But again, here we are. What is this season? This is episode five, and I've had to see them in bed four out of five episodes. This is true. Christ. Well, I almost it, wonder, and I don't know this for a fact, but I wonder if it was like a TNT mandate. We must see more sexy time. <laughs> I've had to begrudgingly uh, see Emily's point on this because the way that he's <laughs> the way that he's been portrayed for like the last about season ish has not been great. <laughs> begrudgingly. Hey, what I'm saying I is I like Sheridan and I like Box Lightner, but you know, seeing this from another perspective, it's been hard to be like, I can't argue with your point, Emily, at mm-hmm. several times about the last season. It's been I, it's been not great because I don't, Yeah, I don't disagree because I've this is the first time I've watched this show with putting my review goggles on and Sheridan hasn't been as hardcore great as I think he was before. Right. And I'm sure a lot of that actually has to do with, you know, you grow up, you've aged, and our perspective in 2024 is vastly different than the late 90s on just Absolutely. acceptable and unaccept- unacceptable behaviors. To quote Yellow Card, you grow up or you get old. You don't do both. The mm-hmm. fact that you guys were teenagers when you were watching this, so. I didn't watch this in my teen years, but I was young 20s. Oh yeah, I watched it when I was in my teens and still a baby. Before the brain was fully developed, I liked Lockley a lot. (laughs) We're not surprised. (laughs) Ew, Scott. What you're making assumptions now? I can like somebody. I I gotta agree with Scott on this one. Just wait for River of Souls. Everyone will turn to Lockley at that point. I'm not saying she's not pretty, but she's not Claudia Christian. This is true. And they 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 made her a better in this show than they did on Lewis and Clark because she just way overdone on there. Uh, you, you keep saying Lewis and Clark like they're explorers. I said Lewis and Clark. I heard Lewis and Clark, and I'm okay. like, what is All it? Right. Like, it's is definitely about, Lewis and Clark. Is this about Pocahontas or what are we no. doing? <laughs> One, Dean Kane's a douche, and two, it that show doesn't hold. Well, so is Terry Hatcher, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where are we at? <laughs> We've been We're talking not. about Lockley and Sheridan maybe have shagged. That we've got that done. So anything else we want to talk about with this episode? Or like Lurker's Guide, do we just want one paragraph and call it a day? Have we seen Trace before, like as another character? Because he looked really familiar. Yeah, you saw him in Mortal Kombat. 
I never saw more. Yeah, and he was he was on like a full season of Jag. I I like the actor. I think he's he's got some decent range and does a good job. Unfortunately, he is no longer with us. Yeah, he passed away a long time ago, two thousand three, right? Was it? it? Was a while ago. Yeah, two thousand and three. Yeah, but yeah. I I I really liked him on Jag. Nicole, what do you got? So I want to talk about the vigilante justice. Maybe it's the Italian in me, but I really enjoyed the whole application of terror. Get this motherfucker in a room and circle. Like, first of all, they cut the power. They took everyone out. It was awesome. One by one, they're taking everybody out. And then he's faced with the guy that he beat up and he jumped. And they're telling him to fight and he won't fight. And they're literally mocking and ridiculing him while he's getting his ass beat. It was so cool. And then not only did security just kind of stand by, let them do their thing. Then after he got knocked the fuck out, then they arrested his ass. That was so sick. That whole scene. I was like, damn. And then with the at the end, when they said the Mimbari don't back down from a fight, they just keep going. Everyone thinks, oh, the Mimbari, they're kind of peaceful and woo woo and this and that. But clearly they will fuck your shit up if you cross them. I, I really enjoyed that. And I wasn't expecting that. And then when, you know, Delenn pulled rank on Lockley and Lockley was pissed about it. She's like, I'm not allowing this. And then she's like, all right, well, tell me about it. And then as she's explaining it, they kind of see it setting up. And it was just the way that it was done from start to finish like the production the way they did it the turning out the lights the you know the narration as it's happened like it was just so cool it was probably my favorite part of the whole episode and then the other thing i'll say is that when the guy who didn't fight was talking to the elder guy about how he should have done something and he didn't want to die without a reason the one quote that he said was our greatest truth is that death will have a meaning if you are in your fullest pursuit of your heart that quote i wrote that down because i thought that was such a good quote because like to me it was just a reminder of always pursue your dreams and always go for what you want and no matter what happens if you're in pursuit of what makes you happy then you can say that you were like living your life a way that meant something and i just really really like that and you know i'm cheesy and sentimental and shit so i really enjoyed that see nicole i found the terror thing differently which I, I like the twist on it because I didn't, I didn't remember this, was when Delenn comes in there and she says, we're going to use terror. Uh, I thought, just as you did, that it was against Trace. Same. That, that wasn't what they were doing. They were trying to exercise the terror out of the Mimbari because they even asked at the end, are you afraid still? No, I'm good. I'm mm -hmm. sad. So really, it was a training opportunity. I did love that they called trace a bully and said that you know he's a coward and he doesn't do anything then beat the shit out of him but i i found it fun that the idea was the mimbari weren't trying to do terrorize trace they were trying to exercise terror from the mimbari who got beat up yeah and it's like he faced his fear and he conquered it mm -hmm. it yeah. was really it was just really well done kevin yeah i particularly liked that scene i mean who who was bullied as a child um or young person hasn't thought of you know wanting to see their bully reduced like this and my guess is that when jms wrote this he was probably thinking about a particularly colorful um situation from his past where he was uh brutalized and it, it is quite a vivid part of his autobiography becoming superman which i know we haven't talked about in a while it, it is a both heartbreaking, but also, um, you know, really, you know, formative uh, scene in the book. Uh, so I, I recommend it to everyone, including the newbies. As soon as we're done with the series, they should definitely read the book because it's fantastic. It's also the same situation that caused San Diego get nuked in the Babylon 5 timeline because he <laughs> really hates San Diego now. So he just nuked the shit out of it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got anything for the episode? One other thing I want to mm -hmm. mention, there is a ton of scenes in this versus other episodes where it is mostly guest stars, which created a different dynamic and, you know, more work on the part of a director. So I thought David Eagle did a good job with this episode. I know that Mira Ferland talked a great deal about Mr. Bay who played Turbal. I guess uh, he was uh, Austrian and uh, she was from, you know, Yugoslavia, but her her mother um, spoke German and taught, taught to her. So 
they would talk on set and she was a huge fan of of uh working with him but it it does it, it this definitely has a different feel to it and a great deal of that is based on that it is more heavily weighted towards the great guest stars in this episode than other episodes were we'll go ahead and end the conversation there for learning curve and we'll go to our questions and predictions so for those who have not been with us before again i don't know why you picked this episode of jet bomb but welcome our newbies are going to give us any lingering questions that they have and then any predictions that they may have uh, for what's going to come up next. So let's go to Jesse first. Questions and predictions. I think the general question of what really happened between Sheridan and Lockley was my number one question. As soon as I heard her say, well, that's just not like him. And Dylan was like, wait, what? I was like, oh. Oh, 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 there's more to this than we know. My other question is, do we see Lanier again? Because we he's brought up in the episode about how he's like doing all the stuff and being super extra. Dylan said, well, let me know. So I want to know if we see him again, I guess, is my question. Nicole? I don't really have any questions. I feel like as these episodes are going on, they're more like self-contained. It doesn't leave you with a lot of lingering questions as, as much as the previous ones. But yeah, I just want to know what happened with Lockley. What's the background with that? Do Garibaldi and Lockley ever squash their beef and learn to like work together or become friends or at Does least... Does Lockley ever squash Garibaldi's beef? I mean, <laughs> maybe. But like, do they ever, you know, kind of become friendly or allies i guess as closely as they can be yeah other than that i don't really have anything else emily i just want to know if lockley was sheridan's rebound after his wife didn't actually die and if there might actually be more tension there than uh we know about at this point because that would actually make for an interesting storyline at this point because yeah i need something <laughs> <laughs> i need something i will say again we we haven't really praise the arc stuff for a while. So I will on this case, when you go back, if you ever find yourself watching season five again, this revelation that we haven't received yet is very hinted at in that first interaction between Sheridan and Lockley. There's a lot of little foreshadowing there that you just don't catch until you know, oh, there is something. So I love watching this on rewatch because you get yeah. to catch these little. I'm kind of hoping we find out what she actually did during the war. Because mm -hmm. I'm still under the impression that she followed orders but didn't follow orders she wasn't gonna go against them but she also wasn't gonna start opening fire on just random ships without having a better understanding of what was happening so okay and we'll go ahead and end it there with our newbies we'll be back here next week to talk about strange relations hint hint until next week i have been scott and with me has been like Emily, Jesse, Kevin, and Nicole. And be sure to like, subscribe, follow. If you're on YouTube, click that notify button. And either way, please head over to Apple and give us some reviews. And we really do appreciate that. And if you want to join us on the conversation side of things, we have our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter, and our Patreon Discord. You can join us all over there and tell us why we're all wrong or tell us why we're all right. We're too we angry. Do. And, Tell us so. Uh, if you why... would like to address Jesse's anger issues, join our Patreon and help fund the therapy. And to the person I apparently scared away, I hope you have returned and I do apologize. I will not get better. Fuck you and your fragile fucking feelings. Emily does not apologize. Look, we need the view counts. I can suck it up for a minute. We're, we're trying to grow our <laughs> audience. We're trying to grow it. <laughs> you cannot grow shit when you're calling me an angry bitch. No one said, well, I'm not even going to say it. I'll get yelled at. <laughs> Listen, uh, you know what? Nobody else has been angry. For those w not watching the podcast and only <laughs> listening, Jesse is pouring another drink as she is doing this. I was giggling at your hint, hint. What's the hint, hint about? Sir? Well, we were just talking about what's in the background of Lockley and Sheridan, and the next episode's called Strange Relations. <laughs> so take a hint. I think I have a, I think I know. Well, Nicole, would you like to share with the kids a class? Nope. I want to let everyone be surprised and find turns, out for themselves. It turns out that Sheridan and Lockley had a threesome of a Oh, no. We didn't get Jesse's conspiracy theories reported this week. Oh, shit. Okay, I got it. Ready? Steve Jobs faked his own death, and he moved to Egypt. Jesus. Aliens invented chess, because Americans are too stupid. Aliens invented chess? Chess. Chess, not chess, not chess. Chess. It's a little horsey. Chess. 
Oh my goodness. And then um There's some doctors the sign... that do invent chests, but that's something different. I wouldn't know. <laughs> the science <laughs> damn it. The science of predicting the future by reading the lines and crevices in a person's butt is called rumbology. <laughs> my, my my lifeline and my butt's pretty long. I'm gonna be okay. <laughs> if you're still <laughs> listening, your um phrase is what the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't say that without getting banished from YouTube. Yeah, it's now rumpology. <laughs> yeah, rumpology should be the phrase this week. It's rumpology. What the fuck? <laughs> Thank you for listening to Gray 17, a Babylon 5 podcast. You can find all the places to listen to and watch this podcast at anchor.fm slash gray 17 podcast or youtube.com at gray 17 podcast. We want to hear from you. So join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or Patreon. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review where you are listening to or watching this podcast. Gray 17 is not affiliated with, and the podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by Warner Brothers or any other owners of the Babylon 5 copyright. All clips included in this podcast are the intellectual property of the respective copyright holders. They are included here for purpose of review, and no infringement is intended. The opening and closing themes are available from Falling Matter on YouTube. And what's out there? The rim. And beyond that? The truth. Welcome back to Beyond the Rim. For those of you who have not watched past Learning Curve or don't remember what happens after Learning Curve, this is where you should leave now because we're going to talk spoilers. But if not, we'll just go ahead and dive in to the questions and predictions from our three newbies. And the first one is, do we get to see Lanier again? Question mark. Yes, we do. Okay. So my, my question about Lanier is, would this episode have been better if they had had Lanier be one of the two uh, or maybe just condensed it into just Lanier coming back and kind of rewritten this episode. Not that it was bad the way that it was. I, I guess I just wish that Lanier had had something to do with, with the episode and that they had brought him back for it. I wonder my, what you guys thought about it. My senility is going out because I thought for sure this episode had Lanier in it when I started watching it. And I was <laughs> okay. like, oh, wait, no, he's not in this one. It's which neither, makes not Lanier. Yeah, which makes absolutely no damn sense because they're training new rangers and he's not he's anywhere to be found. A new ranger trainee. So I just feel like it made more sense to have him do it. I actually disagree. I think it works without him. Oh, well, I'm not saying it because, doesn't work. I just wish that they had brought him back for it. But I don't agree because the thing is part of what the storyline here is, it's the two kind of have a naive relationship with B5. Lanier, you wouldn't have that. Lanier's familiar with Down Below. I because we've seen him how many episodes where he's met Marcus and down below or done other stuff and down below when he's been looking for Delenn and different things. So mm -hmm. I I don't think having Lanier would have had quite the same impact as having these two people who have never been to B5 and aren't familiar with the environment they're getting themselves into. I mean, you I think bring Lanier into it, it would have been a totally different story than what we got. You couldn't write it as here. I'll take you down to down below and show you around, and then uh, he, the other, the other trainee is afraid, and Lanier's the one that gets jumped and beaten. I think we've seen Lanier whoop an entire room's ass before already. So okay, that's a fair point. That is a very fair point. The whole point is teaching that trainee not to be afraid. Lanier's not afraid. Yeah, at least true. not afraid of anything but being. Okay, himself. that's fair. That's fair. But I, I seriously thought Lanier was in this episode, so. That's the fact that he's not surprised me. That shows you how long I've, since I've watched season five. Yeah, they just have a couple of lines about, hey, I'm not sure he's doing tra ranger training for the right reasons. Like, yeah, no shit. Let mm -hmm. me know if it gets worse. <laughs> Next question. Do Lockley and Garibaldi ever become friends? Ish? Yeah, I, they become colleagues. I don't yeah, think they're ever... not, they're not they're... hostile by the end of the series. No. They're not going to be drinking buddies. And sorry, Nicole, they will never smash. No. But as, as a, uh, Jerry Doyle said in the 25th anniversary Comic Con when they were doing the auditioning that Tracy was going to be the best captain and the least likely to screw him. <laughs> well, and you know Garibaldi's in a committed relationship at this point, so it would make him much, much less likable if he was uh, banging the captain. Yeah, it wouldn't be the only wagon he's fell off this season. 
Well, Hopefully. yeah. And that's but... the thing. Unfortunately, Nicole, uh, Nicole, unfortunately, Garibaldi is going to have to go through another little bit of fire before he gets on the other end. But I always like to point out that of all of these guys, Garibaldi like gets the best happy ending. So he's rich and he's got right. lease. Right. And then the other question is, what did Lockley actually do during the war? And the answer is, we never find out. This is it. This is as much as we get. Yeah, which isn't much. I at no point thought she was bombing civilian targets. I, I if if I made that no, what you, if I didn't what make I, that clear, I apologize. But no, what you said was that she was okay with Clark building bombing civilian targets. Okay, and 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 to your to your point, I think you make an excellent point that because he was you know controlling the information that she may not have known that at the time at all well Um, and i think i think as i think about that more what i figure would happen is you've got a situation where they run the propaganda so yeah they know okay he probably bombed this colony but then they're being told this colony was uh having let's use this as a term weapons of mass destruction at that colony so we mm -hmm. had to bomb it yeah or uh so i mean i think it's not a matter of just full being naive it's they're being told that there's a reason why this is being happen- happening, and uh, if you're not listening to the voice of the resistance, that's all you hear. Fair point. I don't think it matters what Lockley did at this point. I don't think it matters if she commanded a ship or she was on a mining station or whatever. It, it, the whole point is she is being trusted by Sheridan to run a station after she was on the other side, and he's doing that because he wants to show that we're coming back together, and regardless of what you did during the Civil War, there's a place for you. That's the key. So what she did really doesn't matter too much. We do get some more uh, character development with mm-hmm. her in in Day of the Dead, especially. And I Absolutely. really do like the character development we get in that episode. Yeah, that refers to stuff that happens before the Civil War, but yes, we absolutely do. Right, and that, you know, that's the only episode not written by JMS, and I, I think it's a really good one. Good old Neil Gaiman. Finally, we'll go into predictions, and we only talked about Lockley and Sheridan hooking up. And all the girls were right and wrong at the same time. Emily was the most wrong, and I like that. So Jesse and Emily think that they definitely slept together. Emily thinks it happened after Sheridan's first wife, hint, hint, uh, went missing. And Nicole thinks they may have shagged. So the answer is, Emily was Sheridan's first wife. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a Vegas hookup. <laughs> what did they say? It lasted like six months, something like that. It was short. Yeah, and they were both like on duty at the time. So they they even lived together. They definitely did hook up. But what no one gathered was they are actually ex-husband and ex-wife, which makes things a whole different dynamic. Because I I get the not wanting to tell all of your exes to your new girlfriend slash uh, fiance slash wife. But you probably should say if you have an ex-wife, you probably should throw that out there. Especially if you give her a job walk uh working exactly. very closely with you where this is so incestual we got the president and the first lady but also she's basically the general and at the head of nato together <laughs> and then the person in charge of the station that they are using as their base of operations also bone the president this is way an hr violation well, is what this well, is wait till we get to crusade and she hooks up with gideon Oh my God. Oh, geez. Because that was a thing. Wait till we get to Crusade. Oh my God. Okay. Anything else you guys want to add for the betterment of this discussion? That's what I thought. Okay. We'll go ahead and end it there with our discussion of Learning Curve. Thanks again for joining us. We'll be back next week to talk about strange relations. Mr. Bester comes back and he tries desperately to save an episode. It's going to be great. Until then, I've been Scott and with me has been Luke and Kevin. Be sure to like, subscribe, follow, click all the buttons, check out all the links down below, leave a review if you can. That really does help us out a lot. And we'll see you next week. See ya. Bye. You were supposed to be listening only to your inner voice. I was, Master. My inner voice was smiling. No one has an inner voice that smiles. I do.